Hey everybody, welcome to another edition of American Rambler. I'm your host, Colin Luber. Thank you for listening to the podcast. On today's show, I have Dr. Court Carney. He is back to talk about the recent Peter Jackson doc, Get Back. So, Court is back to talk about Get Back, and it is a long documentary. It's been out for a couple months now. I believe it's in three parts. It's been a little while since I finished it. I think I started it back in December, maybe. I know it was somewhere between Thanksgiving and Christmas. It was nice to have that movie available because it's not a great time of year, and sometimes you just don't want to watch the same old Christmas movies or TV shows or whatever. And I've always loved the Beatles, one of my favorite bands. It's kind of hard to say which is my favorite. I've always loved them a lot, definitely my top two or three consistently have never stopped listening to them I, my love of the Beatles started in high school it was around 16 I think the White Album was the first one I really got into and it just snowballed from there and I've had them on cassette I've had them on CD I've had them on vinyl so I have listened to them a lot let It Be is not necessarily one of my favorites. I've always liked that album, but it's probably been the most controversial because there was a version that came out in 1970, the one uh, most people have listened to or know, the Phil Spector version that came out around the time the, the Beatles announced their official split up, and it had some production that was very Phil Spector in parts, more specifically The Long and Winding Road, and across the universe they got the full wall of sound treatment and some people hated that apparently mccartney didn't like it much although there's also speculation that he wasn't that mad initially but maybe he just signed off on the album version because it was finished and he didn't want to stop it from coming out but there was a second version that came out in the early 2000s called let it be naked which is more of a stripped down album closer to what the Beatles were intending and closer to what we hear on Get Back because we don't see Phil Spector at all nor should we because he didn't come in until later to finish up the album I'm not sure why the album didn't come out in 1969 a Glenn Johns version but uh, took the Beatles about a month in January 1969 to record this and if it ended with the famous rooftop concert which Even if you never saw the original movie Let It Be, you knew about that and had probably seen footage of that, and some of the tracks from it are on the original Let It Be album. So it was the Beatles coming together January 69 to make an album that was kind of live. They did a lot of studio work, but it ended with the live concert because they didn't want to go on tour necessarily, but they wanted to do something that was memorable, and it was. People came out into the streets and... Wanted to see what the Beatles were doing. They, of course, didn't know those songs, so they were hearing them for the first time, and the Beatles were playing them publicly for the only time they ever did it. But you couldn't see Let It Be ever, really, unless you had an old cassette that you got from a video store or bootlegged or whatever. It never came out on DVD, I'm guessing because Paul McCartney didn't like how it portrayed the Beatles. And I'm not sure how involved he was with the making of Peter Jackson's doc, but uh, it definitely puts the Beatles in a better light or a more realistic light, I guess. Uh, There are times when things aren't going great. George does leave the band for about five days, and there are some off-screen things that were pretty ugly that, of course, we don't see. But as we're watching this footage, they do get along better. They start to gel They had been off for a few months after the White Album, but they're coming back, they're writing songs, in a very kind of messy, chaotic process that at least shows how messy the creative process can be musically, and I think probably anywhere, someone writing a book or doing anything creative, it can be very messy. Building a a shed in your backyard certainly can be, and that's kind of what we get here, a messy process that results in the Let It Be album, which regardless of the, the tensions going on in the band and the slow going creatively, it does result in an album in about a month and some really great songs there. So Let It Be is probably in the middle somewhere of my favorite Beatles albums, but uh, 
I wanted to bring in Court Carney because this is just the kind of thing that, that Court likes to talk about. I've had him on to talk about Wilco and Mad Men. He's working on a book on Nathan Bedford Forrest. So he's been kind of in and out of the 19th century and the 20th century teaching pop culture at Stephen F. Austin State University. So I always love having Court on. He's a very knowledgeable and funny guy, and we do have a good talk about Get Back. Kind of loose. I just wanted to get his general thoughts, but he knows his stuff when it comes to the Beatles, and I have him on so he can talk about things like uh, who's playing which guitar. Yeah, I don't know the names of these guitars necessarily. I, he knows that kind of stuff. Being a, a musician himself over the years, he has played in bands, but as someone who writes about music and teaches about music, uh, he's certainly the guy to have on here. So it's great to have Court back. And I hope you will enjoy our talk about the Beatles documentary directed by Peter Jackson, Get Back. I mean, I've been waiting, waiting for this doc to come out and then finally came out and kind of watched it and and chunks here and there and I was like this would be this would be perfect for court because well obviously you know a lot about music but I, I know you've always been a Beatles fan what did you think I loved every moment of it and I, I I you got an email from you and you made a sort of ominous comment that you said you had some thoughts so I want to hear about that it sounded ominous but and I I just <laughs> I just loved it I, I loved every moment of it I even even when you're kind of spaced out you're spacing out when they're spacing out I just yeah I don't know it, it's such a it's such a joy that we have this to the point that it's like well my God how can we where where are the white album tapes you know they don't exist you know it's like finally no, we, yeah we could have eight hours of a hundred hours or whatever it is of, of every major record you want to see. And, 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 Oh, finally we get to see miles Davis, you know, for hours on, but this is what's, what's so cool about it is that we have, we actually have this footage that exists. I loved it. Yeah. I, no, I, I liked it a lot too. I think I had heard, you know, there was buzz around it before it came out. I was, I was getting a little worried because well, it kept getting pushed back, and usually that's not a good thing when you hear about that. But at the same time, like it's footage that's already been done, so like how you know how bad could it be? But Peter Jackson, being him, tends to be a little self indulgent, so I'm like maybe this is just not going to be that fun to watch, uh, especially if you're you're seeing them all bitchy and not getting along and stuff. So I went into it a little worried, and I I think it drags more at the beginning because it's a shitty rehearsal room they're in. They don't like it. They're not getting along. And then once they do the shift to, uh, what was a Savile row, they go yeah. into the, the sec, the second studio things improve a lot. So I think the show kind of picks up momentum in the same way that they did too, as a band. I, I had never seen the original movies, so I'd only seen bits and pieces on YouTube. So, I've heard Peter Jackson talk about it, and I think he obviously he's done a huge service to music fans, Beatles fans, but letting us kind of see it more in real time and be kind of a fly on the wall. I think, yeah, it is. It is. It is pretty amazing to watch, and you can draw your conclusions more easily than if you watch the old movie, which which I've never seen. Have you seen the old one all the way through? I. I well, there's there's three iterations I know that I've seen. The first is a really weird memory, but I remember this would have to have been in the probably mid to late eighties. So I was probably maybe a very young teenager, maybe twelve or something like that. But I distinctly remember a copy, a VHS copy of it was at the one of the places where we rented videos. And I rented it. I d I don't know how legal any of this stuff was. It was a pretty normal <laughs> uh, you know, video store it wasn't anything that I would have been aware of. You know, when you're 11, you're like, is this bootleg? You know, it was just, oh, I'm into the Beatles and here's Let It Be. And I remember seeing it then and not really getting it, right? Because I was like, my, my connection to the Beatles was the music and Let It Be is, is, is not really, it's not that so much. And then I remember in college, uh, someone I know had a clear bootleg of it. And then again, Maybe in the early aughts, a friend of mine had a uh, uh, maybe late aughts had a uh, 
had a copy of it as well, like a DVD copy at that point. But I don't remember. I mean, I remember seeing it. I remember the very first scenes, which is really kind of interesting because the very first opening scenes in my memory are the very opening scenes of the Peter Jackson film, which is Mal Evans putting the the famous, you know, kick drum Beatles logo on the on the stand or whatever. Um, okay. But the, in my memory, and this is this is just my memory. My memory is that Let It Be, the original, is very dour. It's very brown. It's very sort of, <laughs> you know, downcast yeah. in certain ways. And it's hard to dismiss that or remove that from everyone's talking about it. Like, oh, this is a very sad, depressing movie. But it is a very brown, early 70s sort of beige sort of thing. So when you see – have you ever seen the uh, the AB footage where they show – the original footage and then what Peter Jackson's film is, it's amazing. The ability, no. whatever, whatever Jackson and his team were able to do in terms of digitizing and clarifying, and put, it's, it's amazing what they were given and what they were able to produce. It's, it's just, it's, it's, it's crazy. Well, that's interesting because they're, when they're recording and everything rehearsing, it's, it's January in England. So it's already kind of dour and gray and, then the shots of London, even in the, the restored footage, it is kind of brown. Right. As you say. right. <laughs> like we're on the rooftop and they're, they're wearing, you know, kind of muted colors and stuff. So, yeah, there there is that kind of visual component to it. And, you know, them rehearsing at, at Twickenham in the kind of cold. And these are these are night owls. So they're getting there whatever, like nine o'clock in the morning and. It's kind of funny to see them sort of show up at different times. And, like, of course, Paul's usually, usually the first or second person. Ringo seemed to be the most punctual guy of the group. But there's that one one part where Ringo just kind of goes up to Paul and he's like, I'm not well. Yeah. <laughs> From the night before. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So it's kind of funny to just see him come and go. But, you know, it, we're not great conditions leading off uh to make a record but yeah i mean i i feel like i saw footage at one point of of them doing maxwell silver hammer and mm -hmm. i don't know if that was in this version um there's a there's a scene because they're getting the anvil set up so mal yeah mal's playing the, ha the anvil at some point i remember that but it was kind of like paul doing his you play a minor b you know it was kind of a yeah. very tense moment of him telling them all kind of what to play and I, can't, I i don't think that was in i don't know where i saw that it might have been like a boot a bootleg or or whatever but it seems like by the time they they leave the movie studio things are going are going fairly well but did you did you kind of always subscribe to that idea that like this was a, just a disaster from beginning to end or what well it's in it's interesting to because i think one of the reasons why I like Abbey Road so much, and I really do love that record, is it see, it's always struck me that Abbey Road, and this is still probably true even given my new found depth of Let It Be or Get Back. I always thought Abbey Road was such a great moment because the Beatles knew, in my mind, that they, it was sort of a mess. That everything was sort of just a, a, maybe a little bit rushed or like it just wasn't what they wanted to have done. And they also knew, in my mind, before watching Get Back, that uh, they kind of knew they were done. And they knew that they couldn't go out with Let It Be. They wanted to go out on their own terms with something stronger. Bring George Martin back in. That's a whole other conversation. Bring yeah. Martin back in. You know, go back to EMI, whatever it was. And then they record, like, the record that they know they could do at that moment. And that's the goodbye, rather than Let It Be. Having watched this, I still love Abbey Road, but I think it just complicates that whole story because there are moments in here when, and if you if you look at the book, the book uh, that came out with this has some of the, a little bit more of the the uh, conversations. I mean, they had hundreds of hours of, of, of tapes or whatever it was. Right. But John Lennon at one point says, you know, he doesn't want to leave. Like he he likes being a Beatle, right? I mean, and that is so different from what you're like. You know, you're thinking that John's checked out. Paul is over engaged. George doesn't really want to do any of this anymore. And then Ringo's just there playing drums. And there's a little bit of that. But the one thing I thought, and the one thing I see when I've seen the, the, the footage again, John's, John's tapped in. I mean, whatever yeah. problems John had, whether it's the drug abuse that is, or the drug use that we know is kind of underscoring some of this, he's, 
when when they're playing, he's happy and he's there. I mean, we can't say he's happy, but he seems engaged. He's totally seems uh, connected to the group. And I think that challenges some of the perceptions we had. In fact, Paul seems a little bit more irked about certain things than 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 John. I think John's like, let's play this. There's a really great scene when George is saying, I'm thinking about doing my own set of songs. And he kind of pulls John aside and was like, listen, I'd like to do my own set of songs. And and, and John and Yoko, and Yoko in particular are both like, that's a, that's a great idea. You should do an entire album of of your material. Uh, the, the, he, I don't know. There's just a very different vibe that comes across with this. Not to say the seeds of destruction weren't there. That Not to say that you can't point to various elements. We can get into that. But it's a very different story than what I, I was kind of anticipating seeing which does change the Abbey Road narrative a bit in the sense that Abbey Road was not like, oh, let's do something. I think Abbey Road was really clearly uh, a reaction in some ways, but maybe not to the, the extent that I was thinking it was. Yeah, well, and you know, you mentioned the White Album. I mean, if, if, there, were, if there was visual footage of, of the White Album, I mean, you'd see, you'd see Ringo leave for three weeks. I mean, right. it was in some ways right. a lot worse than right. the Let It Be sessions. Well, they recorded and, all separately, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean that that was that was pretty bad. Um and I think, you know, as you say, things do improve as it goes along. Uh they do start to gel. It I mean it was pretty <laughs> it was a little tedious initially cuz like they just they just couldn't finish a song. It was like they'd go into a Carl Perkins tune or or whatever and just kind of go in all these different directions. So as a viewer sometimes it's a little frustrating, but I mean, that was the that was you, the Mark Marin comment. Or, you know, he had that tweet where he's like, "Are they going right, to finish right. the song?" <laughs> <laughs> but you 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 were in a band for a while, right? Yeah. When you were in college, yeah. Do you think this is pretty accurate? In ter- I mean, obviously we're not all the Beatles, but like you, there's so much dicking around and so much talking and so little playing sometimes. Well, like, I think I think my, it captured that. I think it does capture that. I think Pat Sansone from Wilco had a really great take on it. He's like, no, no film has shown how a band really works. And that's sort of, it's boring. And then it's really, really a hundred percent. And then it's all over the place. And you're kind of trying to figure out what the song is and where the song is. I don't know. I think, I think there's something really profound about it in terms of all those old, you know, they get kind of, they get, they get, they hit a wall, right? They hit a wall with a song and then that chord structure or whatever reminds John of some old rock song. And so they go into that and they all know it. And that's the one thing about this documentary. It's so amazing is just how those four individuals knew each other closer in, in, a, in a more, you know, profoundly vulnerable way than, than we imagine. They, they, they knew exactly what the other person was thinking musically. They knew exactly how the other person would approach something and they, and they just can do it telepathically. Yeah. That's, that's something that, that definitely happens if you play with someone for a long time. And I think if you were a fly on the wall with um, a Rolling Stones album or something or in yeah. any other band, any other major band would probably be a lot more like this than what groups have to do now. I mean, with exceptions, but like, if they get a two days of studio time, they basically have to rehearse everything and go in and just cut it live. Some people do that anyway, but like these guys had all the studio time in the world and you know, all, all those major bands of the time. I mean, th- what I've heard of Rolling, I've never seen Rolling Stones footage, anything like this, but like kind of the same deal. I mean, they just be like the worst band for a couple of weeks and then they put it together and then bam, they got a new album. Yeah, no, I think you're hitting on the heart of why this is so fascinating. Um, and there's like about 50 different directions you can take this. But I think there's, I guess the one thing I'll say is that what this shows is how song driven they really were. They were songwriters. And that sounds like a, why are we even saying that? But they, they were not trying to get cool guitar sounds and cool riffs and hot. All, at this point, anyway, they were writing songs. And the song mattered, and everything else kind of didn't. And so it's all sort of song dri- driving, which is, again, sounds so obvious, but I think the, 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 the documentary shows how clearly that is true. George kind of sits back and comes up with his little things. John comes up with his little things. But they're all focused on, on the song. And I find that just really kind of a, a fascinating thing. The other thing I was going to suggest, going back to the White Album, 
is that I don't think enough credit is given to that 10 minute little opening on part one, which is a really beautiful evocative kind of summary of the Beatles in 10 minutes. Um, but it also shows, and the, the focus point is their rudderless. Their, you know, their, their, their manager died. They don't really have a, a clear focus. And I think all of this is, I think white, the white album is sort of all of that uh, on one level, the chaos of it. And this is kind of the, the real world. We've got to make some sense of it moving on now. Right. Yeah. I mean, 1968 for the Beatles is really, really, really intense. Uh, I mean, that's India. Um, that's what do you have? You have like Lady Madonna, I think at the beginning of that, uh, you've got, you've got India, you've got all the makings of the white album. You have Hey Jude. Uh, you have all yeah. of these things, but if you look at late 68, they're kind of off calendar. White album in America comes out sometime in November, but that's about it. Uh, George is doing Wonderwall, and but they're they're kind of off. And I think what's interesting is that then they come back together in January, like okay, let's kind of readdress all all these things. It's funny though because you you're talking about these gaps in time like it's been three years when they <laughs> oh it's about six weeks yeah. Yeah. yeah right it's like okay well it's, it's it's time for another album it's like you just put out a double album you put out like right. four singles and you know so the 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 pro, how proficient they are is is just astounding right. and that they put together right. an album in essentially a month right start right. to start to start to end you know well and I, I um, think. It, and the other yeah, thing no. I was going to say about what you were saying kind of reminded me is I think the clearest, and if, if someone said, what did you take from this? The clearest response is they were not just John, but he's clearly this, but all of them on some level were such primitivists in the way they approached technology, the way they approach music. But they understood intuitively how songwriting worked, how chords worked, how all that stuff worked. But there, but you know, we always John was always seen as the primitive. He didn't know how you know he has that famous thing about the guitar where he calls it a humdinger rather than a humbucker pickup and all this kind of stuff. But they all, <laughs> they all are like that. Like when they're talking about drums, all of them are like, well, you know, the big drum or the little drum. They don't right. have the vocabulary. There's a great scene where I can't. I think it's in part two, where where they're not getting a good bass sound out of the Hoffner, and George Martin comes down and is asking, sort of, sort of politely, but sort of, you know, come on, Paul, to to play the Rick and the Rickenbacker, and and Paul doesn't want to play the Rickenbacker because it was a right hand model flipped or whatever it is, and the nut was was not grooved correctly, and he he was just explaining why he doesn't like playing it as much, but then George was like, but we can get a better sound out of it. And Paul, there's a great scene when Paul says, I don't really know what those knobs do. Like he's talking about his own bass, right? He's like, <laughs> right, I, I, don't right. These, I, I don't know what these, I don't know what these, and it didn't matter to him because what matters if you watch him, he has that Hoffner, especially in Twickenham, he has that Hoffner and he's just strumming it like a guitar, basically. When, when, he's, when he's inventing yeah. out of thin air, get back, which is one of the most beautiful moments of the film. It's like, oh, he's just strumming, right? It, it's, it's not a bass, in that sense, it's 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 just another instrument for him. It's another. I mean, he's a lot more proficient on a lot more things than some of the others. But but this idea that all of them had a very clear, concise, intuitive approach to songwriting, but none of them really had the vocabulary for it. Which, to my larger point, is it shows how important George Martin was to all of this, and to a, to an extent in this particular film obviously glenn johns and what they and what can you imagine the headaches they had they're trying to get something to sound oh, yeah. good with 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 musicians who that just honestly wasn't their thing so much i'm not saying totally but i'm saying a little bit of it i think they were just like is this you know it's kind of like they were all in the sense of like does this vibe is this is this a groove does this vibe does it sound and feel good and then anything else george can do in the in the control room I think that's what this yeah. is. It's fascinating yeah. to watch happen. No, you're right. And, and since the, the sort of um, the point behind this album was to make it essentially sound live, like they're not going to put a no lot of production in right, it. So right, right. you're right. I mean, the, all those sort of shortcomings come through technologically. And when they get to Savile Row, this dude, Magic Alex, is supposed to have this great <laughs> console set up and it's a piece of shit. <laughs> Or those, so George those Martin's like, oh, right. <laughs> oh, oh, that yeah, was my other point. Yeah. I was going to say earlier, 
is that you mentioned that they could do anything they want to, but they can't. That's what's so hilarious. They're like, well, can we, will EMI let us take the recording deck with us? I mean, <laughs> they're the fucking Beatles and they're like, how much is this tape costing? You know, they're still sort of, right. you know, EMI lets Watchmediggy go take the, the stuff all over the place. I think they'll let us do it. And of course, George <laughs> knows money more than the rest. He's like, yeah, you know, how much is this going to cost? All it's funny yeah. um, uh, about how, how precious all that stuff is. And the other thing I was going to say is that growing up, you think the Beatles were so kind of maybe not perfectionist is the word I'd use, but precise. Like these songs were precise gems that they built. And what you realize is that's simply not all that true. They got the song down and they were kind of like, okay, we like it. We move on. I mean, some of those things are pretty intricate, but none of them were really, you know, it's not about virtuosity at all. It's about kind of whatever the song is, is going. I'm speaking generally here, but this idea though, that, these are very profound moments of making beautiful music that are going to resonate across. That's not really what's going on. And one of my favorite, I was re, when you emailed me, I, I went and rewatched chunks of it. And there's a beautiful scene in part three, I think it's don't let me down where they start showing you. These are the, these are the takes that end up on the record. Um, there's these subtitles that come up and say, this take was on, let it be. And it makes you realize, yeah. okay, this is the real stuff, right? But there's a really great take of don't let uh, don't let me I think it's don't let me down and this is the take that's on the on the on the the album and you see Mal in the back pouring a glass of wine for George like during the take like this is <laughs> and, and you you think of it as like this hermetic group of geniuses and I, I hate to use that word you know what I mean like like oh these yeah, are yeah these yeah yeah gnomic people who are creating these these things that they're so intricately in, no, they're just playing. Mal, you could probably hear Mal pouring wine on the, on the thing. Um, it's such a beautiful reminder that that they were just you know late twenty something guys trying to, to do the best song S O N G that they could, uh, and that's kind of the the goal. And that's what they did. Yeah, I, I liked those just those little human moments throughout that you can see them. Yeah. You, like, you know, uh, George has a glass of wine. John has a beer, you know, like they're smoking constantly. Like it, it, just kind of seeing those little things, seeing Mal Evans, how I, who I don't think I'd ever seen footage of him before. I'd heard of him for years and years reading about the Beatles, but like, he's just like giant Muppet of a man. He's just like huge, dude with glasses running around like taking care of everything he hits the anvil so it's just like just stuff like that like seeing george martin read the newspaper during right. one of those songs right. you know right. just these little asides um that didn't need like, to happen but you can see it in this kind of a long documentary well like mal and then like I, um the other the the i guess his assistant is keith the kind of the, the red-haired guy they both are there to kind of make every, you know everything from the toasts and the marmalade, but also the cigarette cigarettes and the guitar strings. But then obviously uh, Mal is in charge of getting some of these words that they're making up on the spot and typing them up. I mean that's a pretty that's that's a pretty fundamental thing he's involved with in trying to you know put all this stuff in order. And they're entrusting him to go back and forth and type up these lyrics, and then they kind of change that back and forth. Um, obviously, he plays the anvil, right? He's, he, I mean, he's, his story is really sad, right? Mal's, yeah. after the Beatles, his story is really sad. But but he just is kind of like he's there, and he was a trusted person to get everything done. And you see all the different people that they they trusted, you know, uh, their, their press guy and all these, uh, you know. It's, 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 it's a really kind of fascinating – uh, glimpse at all of this well and you talked about uh glenn johns i i forgot that he had he worked on this album he you know he did you know the who later and stuff like that but just you're you're, you're watching this you're like oh there's glenn johns wearing some kind of puffball jacket <laughs> <It's like> crazy <laughs> late 60s fashion stuff i i like just seeing what they were going to wear every day after a certain point i'm like they, they never well, seem to wear the same thing twice well, there's a there's a part early on where John and Yoko are wearing the same thing every day, and he says it's for continuity, right? <laughs> so they'll never, <laughs> but but no one else does. And then and then George is wearing some sort of you know, uh, UGG style boot, like very psychedelic boot. I think, there's also that beautiful scene when when George is wanting Mal to go find him a string tie, like a cowboy tie, 
and he's yeah. he's wearing that for a while. But then Glenn John shows up, yeah, like he he's straight from the UFO with his uh, glasses and his spinning kind of. <laughs> It's gorgeous, right? It's 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 really it's yeah. it's really great, and he's so different from George Martin, who of course is showing up in a in a, in a tie every day. Um, right. George Martin, who's like only I think I think he's only like forty two or forty three in this, right? He's not he's not an older <laughs> guy by any means, but he's clearly That's the true. older person within this within this within this group. Oh, the other thing I was going to say about not primitives so much but with john lennon you know today can you imagine how many guitars you'd have at your disposal and john plays that epiphone casino the entire time with only a few exceptions he's not and at one point i can't remember where it was but he says i'm gonna leave this here this is my favorite guitar he that was his guitar that was his tool uh and and you know paul has a couple of basses he's got a couple of hoffners at the hoffners at the beginning he's got the rickenbacker um, but he's basically playing that Hoffner, that one Hoffner. John's predominantly playing the Epiphone. George is playing different instruments. He has that, that gorgeous uh, Rosewood Telly. But it's interesting that it's not about, oh, all these different guitars and all these different sounds and what we can do. John's like, I like playing this guitar. This is the guitar I want to play. <laughs> this is it. Yeah. It's is a, yeah. an Epiphone that's probably at that point a few years old. It's not well, about – the way. It's a very interesting transition between the White Album and and Abbey Road because, they're, yeah, they're sort of still in, in White Album mode in terms of, yeah, they're just kind of being a rock band and, and not getting too much into the production. And John's is playing the one guitar. But right. I was astounded at how many songs from Abbey Road they're already rehearsing. Right. I mean, very rough, some of them. But you've got like a third of Abbey Road, essentially, they've already right gone through and right. um they've got the singles too john uh or george does old brown shoe so it's like yeah. the amount of songs that they're bringing to the table is well just you know, you have a lot of a lot of what goes on all things was past or got past is kind of filtering oh, right, through their right. early or, renditions uh, of stuff that'll be on imagine um yeah yeah paul paul I think there's has one a, from, from ram yeah paul has is there a, one from ram yeah backseat in my car yeah, that's uh, it. Yep. He's like, he's like, yeah, I just came up with this last night, and you're like, okay. <laughs> it sounds just like the Wings song. <laughs> I guess not. We not Wings. I'm gonna but Paul and Linda later. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's like Paul's like, I'm I'm gonna rehearse over here, and then like he's got Oh Darling or something like two minutes yeah. later. You're like, I mean, he's just an animal in this movie. I, I think for me, I mean, John's always kind of been my favorite, but watching Paul in this time period i think he did a lot of his best songs and so just seeing him in action is pretty phenomenal well when he it's 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 really exciting when you i mean there's this scene when he's basically inventing get back but there's another later scene when when you know the word tucson is coming up but they don't have tucson yet (laughs) and he's playing it and they're coming up with something that works and, it, you know, they're not trying to come up with profound lyrics. They're talking about what works. There's one point when John or Paul is like, you know, it, there's too many, uh, uh, you know, guttural syllables or whatever. It's like it's hard to sing. So it's all about what what what, what works singing. How can I sing this more easily? Um, and then they finally, you can hear them touching on Tucson. And when they get it, it's like, oh, that's pretty cool. Like you saw them work it out. There's that scene when George is writing something. And he's asking John for some advice, and John's just, you know, put in pomegranate or whatever when you get to the song, when you get to the words you don't know. But right. after that, when they're trying to put the set list together, Paul is like, isn't it interesting that there seems to be some some continuity in lyrics? So even he's thinking, you know, don't look back and uh, don't let me down and all these different things. And he's making these connections kind of on, on the spot, like, oh, yeah, it's kind of like a conversation here with two of us. And, all these long and winding road and all these kind of things. So it's kind of like, you know, they, they're, they're able to get to the, the profound moment, but they are not completely th- thinking let's be profound here. In fact, they don't seem to be thinking about that at all. Yeah. Um, no, I mean, these, these songs collectively def- definitely have a different vibe from, from their other albums. And I, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I guess I always liked the original let it be album. I, I kind of wondered why certain stuff wasn't on it. Like, don't, don't let me down. Uh, it, it's on the new one, the the Let It Be Naked. It's on there, but I don't know what what was sort of what's always been your take on the original album versus later iterations of it. 
I remember as a kid, again, really loving Get Back. Like, that was just a, a, a great song. You know, I just really loved that song as a yeah. kid. The song that, that uh, I, I, I always liked the record, but it was kind of like I liked all their records. You know, when you're, when you're 10 or whatever, you're like, because, you know, when I would have gotten into them, it would have been the I was a kid, so the, the mid '80s. I mean, they're long gone at that point, obviously. I mean, John's dead at that point, and so it's kind right. of like I think we had this conversation with Bob Dylan. It's like your entry point is the the totality of the 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 catalog. Like you don't you're not listening to them from from Please Please Me or Love Me Do. You're listening to that at the same time as you're listening to Get Back, and so it all becomes a part of one thing. And you knew the chronology, or I started learning the chronology. But but it's like, oh, these are all Beatles songs. You're not thinking of them in the same way. In, in fact, as, as a lot of people from my age probably did, you thought of them as kind of like the red and blue, right? Because you had the, the Capitol Records um, uh, red and right. blue uh, compilations, and you had the early period and the late period, and you kind of thought in those terms a little. I was also thinking a lot of Long and Winding Road, because when I was a kid, that song was just another song that I, I, I liked it. And then I got to a point where I really disliked that song. I just didn't... I didn't care for it. I probably bought into some of the, oh, Spectre, blah, 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 blah. And then when Let It Be Naked came out, remember they had like, it was all like, the, here's the original unadorned Long right. and Whitening Road. And I was like, well, I don't really care for this one either. You know, it's like, I, I don't know. But now all of a sudden I'm like, I kind of like that song. Like there's something about it that's like, okay. And I kind of like the Spectre song. I think it's sort of an insane sort of, mishmash of john not really knowing how to play the bass and then <laughs> these wild strings but here's the other thing I, when i when i think of john i think of him as uninterested but i don't think that's the case i think he just was like that wasn't an instrument he was he was that proficient with it was you know he's playing that really cool fender six uh kind of guitar bass but i think he's just like he was he was in it at the moment, and if you listen to these recordings, I mean, he's obviously making mistakes all over the place. But so is Paul, right? I mean, there's all sorts of flubs throughout all this stuff. I don't oh, know. I yeah, think yeah, sure. I I, I, th I think it's I think it's great. The one thing when well, you were talking about Let It Be, I, Let It Be Naked. I don't. I the thing I think that's cool about I haven't gone back and listened to that in a long time, but they do the composite. Don't they do the composite of Don't Let Me Down? Like he flubs the lyrics, and so they have the. I have to go back and listen. I, I, okay. Cause he, okay. cause yeah, cause yeah, John blows it on, on the rooftop. Yeah. Um, always apparently had trouble with his own lyrics. If you <laughs> well, seen 72 yeah. in New York city. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. but also across the universe was on the original album. Oh, then right. I think right. it got cleaned up a little bit on the, let it be naked. But I think actually the single version for the, the world wildlife federation that's on yes. past masters. I like that one the best. But yeah, yeah. It's closer well, it's also to those weird things. Isn't it interesting? I was thinking about this the other day. How let it be the song is is, is not a big part of this at all. I mean, that was kind of the one right. piece of film you knew. It's bearded Paul looking. You know, that's that's peak Paul, right? <laughs> Paul with that yeah, beard right. is peak Paul. And and George yeah. says, I like that. I like that beard. You know, it's like that's that is <laughs> that is you know he's not going to get better than 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 that. It's kind of like. Um, you know, John Lennon has that 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 Sergeant Pepper mustache. He has it from like, I've tried I've tried to figure out how he's had it from like December '66 to like May '67, <laughs> but that that handlebar mustache that he has is pretty rad, right? That's pretty rad. <laughs> uh, but bearded Paul, but 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 let it be, but let, let it be is not really a big part of this this film. Like that, get back obviously is, but let it yeah, be, which is yeah. the most famous footage we have of of Paul staring down the camera. Isn't there? But going to your point, you know, you have those two versions, and you have the version George Harrison has the same, his his guitar solo is very different in both. the 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 album version and the single version are different solos, and you have people who are very adamant about which one is the the better than correct version. The other one's garbage. There's no middle ground. You can't like both. One is <laughs> one is phased out and bizarro and garbage, and the other one is is beautiful or flippant whatever it is but like i think yeah. i think they you wonder were these kind of just decisions on the fly like why would the why would the why would you have that like why would you have uh different you know different versions of the single i mean i know some, some of that might just be like what sounded good at the time and they mastered it and moved on that's my that's my guess i don't know i don't think they fretted yeah. i don't think they fretted about this stuff as much no well i think 
they weren't even really keeping numbers of the takes on a lot of these. Right. Like, um, get back. I don't know if that was a numbered take or, or what. So, um, no, I've, I've always liked the, the George, I don't want to get too deep in the weeds here, but I've liked the solo on the original, let it be better than the other one. See, you've got um, hard opinions on this. I do, but cause it's, it's a more of a <laughs> buzzed out rock solo and the, the other one. Yeah. So, um, no, I mean, there's, I kind of like the original Let It Be song, Long and Winding Road. I don't like the original Phil Spector version. and But you're right. It's kind of like it's somewhere in, they needed to meet somewhere in the middle, maybe do some kind of something strings on it to, to beef it up a little. Because as the naked version, it, it's, it seems a little thin, a little demo-y. But I like right. that you can hear the piano. I like the lyric and just the singing appeals to me more. So I kind of like the stripped down version more. I was listening to, <laughs> I was listening to the Beatles channel yesterday and Chuck D was on. He said long and winding road is his favorite Beatles song. Really? Like, okay. So well, there's so many that hit you at different times or they, yeah. you know, wh- you know, I'm not going to say that one, you know, the stuff I was really into like in grad school was that real mid period revolver rubber soul. You know, I remember Steve Earle when he was doing his, some of his comeback stuff in the '90s was like, you know, they had Revolver like in the studio. That was like their model they wanted to do. And if you listen to his record like Transcendental Blues or whatever, that's a very revolvery song. Okay. If you listen to Sam Phillips, all of her records, I mean, she she is so close to John Lennon's voice in sort of that I'm only sleeping vein. I mean, she's her voice is so much like that. And there's a period where I thought that was the be all end all. It's sixty five, sixty six. Um, but I, you know, if, if you had to ask me back in the day, I probably said White Album was my favorite just because it was so chaotic and bizarre and cool and weird and, and hip, hip. You know, there's all sorts of great things in there. I don't know. I think I think at this point I'm just kind of like the sum total of them, you know, <laughs> is, is yeah, greater but, than the sum of its parts, you know. It's like, okay. I, I mean, I, I've never disliked Let It Be. I, I do think – you know, Paul needed to put out a version with, with some alternate cuts uh, or alternate versions of, of the of the tracks on there. And he cut out stuff like Dig It for the Let It yeah. Be Naked. So I, I like having I like having both of those albums. But, yeah, I mean, I don't think there's a, a Beatles album I dislike. It's just yeah. it's just a matter of preference and that we're still well, getting new footage and new material on them. Right. Fifty years later is pretty astounding. Right. Well, Let It Be Some was great the, the song. The song Let It Be was the first song that I. It was the. It was the first song I played bass publicly on. So I was in a, the high school jazz band. So this would have been like 1989, probably. And the very okay. first song of the very first concert was Let It Be, which is a weird opener when I think back on it. But that was the, yeah. the opening song was was a jazz <laughs> band version of Let It Be, and that was my. My first public performance on 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 bass guitar, so I've always had kind of a, a soft spot for that, I suppose. What was uh, the, the first song I... you ever learned? What's the first Beatles oh. song you ever learned? Oh goodness! Oh goodness! Um, I know like, every guitar player, you know, at some point you go through Blackbird, and once you get the Blackbird down, you think that you've done something, and you realize that everyone plays Blackbird. I used to have that. Um, it was a Beatles fake book, like a just a spiral bound collection of all just their, you know, court with the chord shapes and everything. And I, I played that certainly in high school. That's probably how I taught myself how to play guitar was just going through that. Uh, things we said today. I always thought that was cool. Things we said today where it goes from the A minor to the A major. Like, that's a cool shift. You don't hear that that often. Um, yeah, I like that song. Yeah. There's also when you're watching Get Back, the, the way they communicate, there's a real quick part where when John says, I don't remember the chords and Paul's like they're Diana chords. And he's referring to this Paul Anka song that they covered, but that song had a chord structure that they really liked. I think it's C a minor F G or something like that. But the fact that even at that point they're calling, he calls out Diana chords um, is really cool because it's like, that's what they would have done in Hamburg or whatever. And that's the one thing I was going to, what go on. Well, yeah, I think that's kind of like a classic rock and roll chord progression, right? Like, Right. Isn't that like sleepwalk? That's like a C A minor. Isn't that kind of the same right. similar progression? Yeah, go, go ahead. But in, in, as they're learning songcraft, you know, this would have been ten years before or whatever. They're they're clearly are still thinking when they when they when they got that chord structure down, and that's what he's they're still doing. The one thing I thought was really fascinating that hasn't been talked too much about 
is their collective memory. And there are the four of them when they're talking, their references, they're all hermetic, right? They're just all tightly connected. But there's that um, a, a, a show that wasn't so po- seen in the United States, I don't think, but that, that Beatles in the Round or whatever, when they're filming the Beatles and different, and they keep referencing that with the film. That was clearly a touch point for them. It's, it's not so well known here, but it was a TV program that they were filmed in a particular way. And they keep talking about it. They talk about Hamburg a lot. Certainly John brings it up a lot. Um, there's that really uh, cool scene when George is trying to engage Paul and he's like, we could do some of the oldies. And he's like, every little thing, he's playing the riff to that. And, and Paul doesn't seem interested at all. But like, they're, and the thing to keep in mind too, certainly after 66, and this is the hard part to imagine, is that some of those songs, they only played maybe even a handful of times. They get the recorded takedown. They're not playing them live. Right, so, right. you know, any, anything after 66 would have been a studio song only. And if they got that in a few takes, they never would have played it. And, and, and some of those songs on the White Album, you know, some of the musicians, some of them, they weren't on all the songs. So it's kind of crazy to think that in 1969, they're thinking about songs that, well, we could play this. It's songs that they, they don't know. And that's why Paul McCartney today is at a disadvantage because he's talking to fans who have obsessed over <laughs> everything for, for 50 years. And he might have played that song, you know, once or twice. Yeah. Um, and like, so what's your working memory? Like, hey, Bulldog or something, which they clearly did in an afternoon. Are, is that a song you're going to even remember the chords to? And if I mean, I don't know. It's it's a really interesting. Uh, they're in a very interesting place. But the idea of memory, the way they they're they're using their collective memory, thinking back on shows they've done. Uh, obviously, that scene with Paul with the set list still taped to his bass, and they're going over, you know, those old songs that they played. Um, but then their their kind of personal memories kind of fuse into that. I think there's something really interesting about how this plays on the collective memory of, of the viewer connecting to this material, but then the collective memory of those four people, uh, you know, who are now, what are they, 29 or so, uh, almost 30. Uh, George is like probably, George is younger. What is he, 26 or 27 during this? But I think it's, 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 it's a really interesting time for like a late 20-something person to kind of reflect on what they did as a early 20s person. That's a very human trait, but to do that within the studio, given the language of songwriting, I think it's a really cool sort of, uh, it's not just cool that we're seeing them create, and it's not just cool that we're seeing them create songs that we know. It's also seeing them work through stuff in a way uh, that has a, a certain degree of profundity to it in terms of what you were doing at 29 or what, you know, at 29, when you're thinking about what you did in ni- at 19 in the context of of songs i think it's pretty cool yeah it's pretty phenomenal to think you know all this is being done in their 20s and and maybe songwriters do their best stuff in their 20s uh i don't know but but yeah but like you're saying the that they are kind of looking backwards and forwards at the same time there's sort of like this nostalgia for when they right. were younger but it's not really that much younger and it's also yeah. not that much nostalgia it's it's sort of nostalgia at yeah. times, but other times it's kind of anti-nostalgia yeah. I think it's really interesting. And then when you look at the seeds of destruction, all the stuff that you've heard about, about Yoko or whatever. And then Paul has that really knowing comment. He's like, in 50 years, they're not going to say the Beatles broke up because Yoko sat on an amp. But it's like, well, that's literally what people have said for a long time. And it's it's not true. I mean, I would love to have seen more of, of Yoko. I would love to have seen more of the conversations with her and Linda and, and the others. I mean, she's obviously a part of all of that. I don't know, but what you do see in glimpses is not that so much, but what you do see are those meetings with Alan Klein. John's going off to meet with Alan Klein. Obviously, Paul, I think, is talking with the Eastmans. All of that stuff is much more directly connected to the destruction of what they're doing than anything else. And we see that in glimpses. Um, we've got a 130 meeting with Alan, or then Alan comes by. I mean, that's the stuff that will end up destroying in large measure. And not not to mention, of course, they don't need to be destroyed. They want to do different things. So that's that, that, that's also there. But. Yeah, you're you're right. I, there is a lot of stuff going on behind the scenes that that affect the cohesion of the group. And with with Yoko, yeah, I mean, I I don't know. I I think however you think about her, 
one way or the other, you'll probably see what you want to see here. I mean, sometimes she's just she's just there. Other times she seems totally disinterested. But then, like you say, like other times she's talking to to Linda, or you know, she's she's fine. I mean, there's, there's no like tension around well, her. I mean, she just she's quiet most of the time. She's also there for the for the release, right? So when George leaves. And the chronology is sort of, I can't remember quite the chronology, but George quits the band. And I think that afternoon, like he leaves like after the, before launch or whatever. I, I could be wrong about this, but it's something like this. And then the the three of them really don't know what else to do. So they end up going to that jam. And then, then Yoko is, you know, vocalizing. Uh, and then, and, and Paul and John and, and Ringo are just like going through it. Like they know it's a big deal, but they're not willing to, admit that's as big a deal as it is yeah george leaving the way he leaves and i listened to the peter jackson peter jackson talked to mark maron a few weeks ago and and mark kind of asked a little bit about that and jackson said and this has always been a little bit of an unclear part because it delves directly into the personal but he said peter jackson said that what their understanding was is that there was a lot of strife going on between george and patty and that there was some real house, you know, domestic problems going on on one level or another. And that's what really drove George out, that it wasn't him playing two of us for the 80th time or whatever. It was it was this other thing. Um, now, that could be a, a fossilization from, you know, Peter Jackson, but you would think he would know enough of those other conversations that maybe there's there that, that, that's there it's a it's a fascinating moment though it really is and when you see it and you see the three of them left alone and then they start jamming and then yoko comes in and is 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 in that kind of real kind of uh kind of cathartic jam i think there's something really interesting there now when john says if george doesn't come back we'll get clapped and was he serious about that or is that just a sarcastic I, shitty joke he made I'm, I'm assuming both, right? I mean, it's John. That's the thing. You talk, you talk about your favorite Beatle. It's like I grew up. It's kind of like, I remember Chuck Klosterman talks about how you, you want to say you're into Han Solo, but you're really, when you're a kid, you want to be Luke Skywalker because that's what you're like. To, you know, yeah, it's, it's really cool to be a Han Solo later, you know. But, but and I feel a similar way was like, well, of course I was a Paul. I was a bass player. I love Paul McCartney. You know, but then you get a little bit older and you're like, I'm actually more of a John George. You know? <laughs> uh, but yeah. then they're all and, and let's just be honest, they all have very terrible sides to them. They're just, you know, some have better have had better PR teams and others we just haven't delved into so closely because we don't maybe don't want to you know, confront how terrible of certainly as men they, they, they often were. But there's something about John that given all of that and and not to dismiss it, but you're also like John was a very kind of charismatic, uh, funny guy, and I think that probably gave a lot of cover to a lot of the other stuff. Well, I, I just with John, there's that I love that scene where they're all kind of sitting around and things are really tense, and then John starts riffing. He does this masturbation rift about the Boy mm -hmm. Scouts or something, right? And like you can see, Paul doesn't want to laugh, but like John right. just keeps doubling down on it, and Paul eventually just starts cracking up, and I. I really like that. That was kind of a classic John Paul moment there. And Yoko's like, what's going on? And he's like explaining it to her, but he's, <laughs> that's very funny. But there are these signs. Yeah, you can tell. And there also, you can tell when there are, uh, you know, there are moments when obviously the camera just missed a, a, a bit of a, a puff here or there or uh, yeah. something. Sometimes the uh, Paul's eyes are a little bit more red than at other times, <laughs> but um, right. and, uh, you know, I mean, part of it would be. Can you imagine sitting in a that that Savile Row studio is so small? And you imagine just the amount of cigarette smoke and just smoke in oh, general. God. You have to. It's pretty, pretty, pretty. Uh, uh, I, I don't know how you'd be able to get through some of that. Yeah, there was a, a lot of people in there eventually. As, as I want to add, though, that as a film. And someone else mentioned this. And I think it's it's true. There is a really beautiful moment when you see Linda start taking photographs, and then the film shows those actual photographs, like she's taking pictures, and then you see the actual photograph she's taking. Yeah. And 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 there's something that's just really moving about that. It's it, it's 
it's an emotional story and it, it, it it's it's romantic i know right now it's really cool to talk about how the you know how you hate the Beatles and the Beatles. You know, who cares? All that kind of stuff. But I think there's something really kind of uh, touching about all of that. That these were real people doing real things that that had a considerable impact. I mean, I don't know. I don't think going back to your original point uh, a while ago. I don't think if we saw the Let It Bleed sessions or if we saw My God, can you imagine the eight hours of of exile? I mean, that'd be it'd be almost too much to handle, but I don't think you'd come away from the same sort of story as you would with, with this. I think there's, there's something else going on here that I think is, is very, very unique. I mean, I would love to, don't get me wrong. I'd love to see eight hours of exile. Footage, but, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, well, you know, it's just kind of one of those things. I mean, it, it, classic his, you know, the historian's point of view of, you know, they're going to break up. So you right, have a certain perception right. of how, everything right. is going whereas stones doesn't happen the who doesn't really happen led zeppelin you know i mean so like you could see footage of pete townsend clocking roger daltrey with his guitar or right. something but like they're gonna stick together they're gonna stick it they're out still, um, <laughs> they're at separate hotels today but they're still playing <laughs> but you're, you're actually you're absolutely right i think that's what's what's interesting about it. we know the story we know the story has a beginning and an end point and we're seeing the beginning of the end and yeah. that's not like – it's not just the making of a record. You know they're splitting up. They don't necessarily know. And that gives you such a, a, a wildly uh, interesting perspective on all this. You know that the words Alan Klein are going to send Paul out the door, but not yeah. not quite yet. Um, yeah. and, and, you know, uh, uh, there is a Facebook uh, scuffle of uh, – <laughs> Of, oh, uh, I'm, I'm not on very much, but I follow a few people, and there is a you know, how they're the best band in the world, and people were making fun of it, and 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 they weren't right. I mean, you could you could name a half dozen easily bands at the time that were probably you know better better bands, right? But they they had what they had. They were tight when they needed to be tight. There's that great scene when Paul's like, you know, the Beatles are the best when our backs are against the wall. They go out, they do that last concert. And it's rough at some point, but at other points they're they're they are right there. Um, yeah, I do wonder like what they ended up doing like you know get back like five times on the roof. You forget like they just did the songs over and over and over again. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. Uh, but I I think I think there's something uh, that they they definitely had that they it, it's not about virtuosity. But it's about them coming together in, in, in a pretty rough hewn shape and then doing it. And also, uh, this is a side note, you know, one after, uh, uh, what is it? Um, the old song they do on Let It Be? One after 909. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I never thought yeah. that was like a, a throwaway, but it's not a throwaway to them. There's something in that song that they all connect to. And there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a scene when uh, Maureen Starkey is just losing it like she just loved that for some that song must have tapped into the cavity you know that song must have tapped into whatever magic they had seven years earlier or whatever it was right because there, that song was not just a throwaway but it was one of the old songs it was that yeah. was it tapped into something and it's also i would love to see more of john when he's doing um hank williams right he does you win again he does um What's the other song he does? Uh, you are my sunshine, I think. Like yeah. John, I, w I mean, I know John goes the um, the Chuck Berry route so often, but it'd been really cool to see him if he had laid down, you know, seven or eight of those songs. That would have been that would have been great to hear too. Yeah, it's pretty phenomenal how many songs that they'll they'll break into. Yeah, right. no, I I just stuff that I never would have thought that they knew. Well, isn't John at one point he's playing the third man theme on his yeah, guitar? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. Where did that come from? But and it's he probably too, was watching it on TV the night before right. or something. A hundred percent, a hundred percent. Or like when when Billy Preston comes in, he's he's so capable that he can play with them. And I mean, not only would he know those songs, but if he didn't know the songs, he would play. He could play them so well because of the level he was at. So they just sounded by they got to, by the time they got to Savile Row, they were just they sounded great. Yeah, and they didn't rehearse. It. They were like, "Billy, have a seat. Okay, we're gonna go in a Don't Let Me Down now or whatever." It's just like, right? Should so we give him the songs? The no, he'll learn. He'll learn them. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, yeah, I really liked. 
I liked seeing that. I liked seeing Billy Preston there. And yeah, just seeing, I don't know. I mean, it's it's sad in a lot of ways because you know they're going to break up. You know, John's been gone for longer than he was around now at this point. Right, right. Um, but just right. seeing them is just is just really great because obviously there are no, there's, you know, I guess there's footage out there somewhere, probably locked in a vault, but that we're able to see all this footage now and Peter Jackson being as meticulous as he was with it. Um, yeah. Even when nothing's really happening, just seeing them is is cool. But they get better, yeah. I mean, by the end, they've they've got the songs down, and even if you don't think "Let It Be" is one of the better albums, it's it's still good. I mean, yeah, there's no. a lot of great songs. And I think it's a glimpse of something that we don't like. Go back to the beginning of the conversation. It's a glimpse of something, the creative process, the ability to to you know. You 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 write a book. I, I'm writing a book. This idea of that blank page, and we can't start riffing on you know little Richard covers while we're writing to get to that next page. But you know <laughs> when you have that that moment when that sentence isn't going right. I think this is the, the analogy I would say that that sentence isn't going right, and then I stupidly you know reach for my phone or something. Uh, when that sentence wasn't oh, going yeah. right for them, they could launch into uh ready teddy or something and 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 do something else um yeah but i think that creative process is what makes people and the other thing i'll say is that the 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 high profile nature of this i mean the disney plus nature of this meant that i saw people online who i didn't think would have any working interest in the beatles watching this and just being blown away by it I, i mean i saw so many people on my feed who were like i didn't know i just i'm i'm obsessed now like they'd get into it and it's not a short documentary. That second part of it's long. And I yeah. think to see that people were engaging in that, maybe they didn't have an interest in it, but it was like the popular thing to watch. It was the, you know, whatever. That that says something. I think there's something deeper there than just the record, than just the performance. I think it's showing us something that, and there's that great meme that happened right at the beginning of it. And the meme was something along the lines of, how how uh, great it was to just see people staring into space smoking. You know, it's like they didn't have the <laughs> they didn't have the phone, they didn't have the Instagram to take them away from their six seconds of writer block. You know, they didn't have that. They 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 were like, okay, well, we're here for two more hours before we have lunch. Something's got to happen. And I think that that process is more profoundly normal, especially for artists and creatives. Than, than people realize and it's it's like in Mad Men when he says you know I uh, you know you you you're paid to kind of do all these different things that don't relate until they do relate right like you don't you know the, the idea of being creative is not uh, easily clocked because it looks like you're not doing anything but what you're doing is all the mental work to get to the point where you are doing something um, yeah it's it's harder for the outsider to, to look at that and I want to let you know that that Colin, you've had me long enough on this podcast. I've now mentioned every other podcast uh, <laughs> that I've been a part of. So I got my Mad Men reference in. I got my Dylan reference. Yeah, no, we, we well, we, I, I kind of keep thinking of these things again and again. And well, yeah, to reference Mad Men, where you know the rationalizing people taking naps in their office, and Don's like, right. Well, they have to be unproductive so they can be productive. You know. Yeah, that's the of, line I was trying to get to. Yeah, exactly. One hundred percent. Yeah. One hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. Um, no, I I think if you know Beatles aside or whatever, just just seeing this creative process and 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 like you said, it this is the analog. I mean, literally analog tape. It's the analog world, kind of at its finest. Where yes, yes, they're like jazz guys. They come in with a little idea and then kind of you know see what we can do in the studio. The amount of studio time was obviously a, a huge luxury and a, and a huge part of it. But they were the Beatles and we've got all the studio time let's use it and and it is kind of interesting to see how kind of ramshackle savile row is even like the microphones they kind of look like there's like it's foam hanging off them or something it's like, right it's not it's not well, uh top notch in some respects well the, you know you're talking magic alex and just the the silliness that he produced and, and you, yeah you're right like you see george george martin just is like trying to he's trying to be above it right like you know right Oh, it's not working. Oh, dear. oh okay. <laughs> yeah. It, well, and, 
it, it isn't it doesn't John have like some weird guitar that Magic Alex made or something like it's kind of strange. It's a guitar, it's like a proto- prototype. Yeah, or some sort yeah. of like you flip it around, it's a bass and it's a guitar. I think Real you know, bullshit it's, artist. Yeah. <laughs> it's there's great one in every. It, there's always one of those guys though, you know, and the the, the, the fringes of these huge groups or some like. Con, man. con artist yeah <laughs> i mean well beatles had a lot i mean alan klein kind of was too uh but i guess he did get them their money that that they did deserve but broke the was like up, there's so. that, that line where it's like you know we've been there's so many con guys on the other side it's, we need to have a con guy on our side <laughs> you know we need a con man and you know honestly uh not to derail since we're probably summing up but you know when you're thinking about spotify and streaming and the Joe Rogan, Neil Young conversation, this is sort of like, you know, it's all part and parcel of the same thing in terms of, of what value we put on this. And, and the music business was, was corrupt in so many ways from the beginning, really, uh, certainly became very corrupt, and that we're still now dealing with that, but we're, we're not confronting it head on. We can't confront the idea that people should be paid for the music or what that even means anymore. We have to talk about, you know, this other kind of deplatforming and all these, these other kind of new concepts we have to, to kind of concern ourselves with. But I think that it, it's, it's a good sort of watching Get Back and then looking at the Spotify uh, conundrum. It's like, you know, uh, how do we value? Why do we value? How can we continue to value or, or even escalate the, the, the valuation of something that is so, you know, so fucking meaningful to all of us, you know? I mean, it may not be yeah. the get back record, but it's still at some point that music is going to mean something to you in a way that's so uh, exponentially removed from, uh, well, what's just streaming revenue source? But yet we've, we've destroyed all of that. And now it's, it, the, the musicians are so you know bereft from all of that. But now we've kind of reduced it to this sort of he said, he said misinformation thing, which, I, which I'm saying is important. Of course it's important. But I think it just dovetails in with this larger story of like, how do we value music? How do we value creativity? How do we allow creative people to be creative, you know, when they're not worrying about studio time or money or whatever it is? You know, I think I think that's a, that's a very long story, and we're 50 years down the road, and we're 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 not any better at dealing with it now than we were then. We have access to much more, but with that access, you know, we haven't really expanded upon what that means in terms of a responsibility sort of concept. Well, and obviously the Beatles were going to be fine financially. Like they're still fine. They're still selling. I don't know when things sort of peaked, maybe, you know, with Napster and digital, it's completely changed things. But I mean, up until, you know, we were in college, people were still buying CDs and you, you could sell albums in a profitable way. I don't know what musicians do now. I mean, obviously with COVID, they can't tour the way they used to. People don't buy albums. Um, they'll get everything they can for free. I don't know what the hell they do. The irony is, if it's true, and I've seen a number of places where it seems to be true, the one the one area where streaming has has the, the highest revenue is Napster. Like Napster is paying artists now more per stream than – than anybody else. I mean, I don't know what the, the economics and the scale of all that is, but that's what that's what's being passed around, and it's probably true-ish. I mean, I just, you know, I think the music business, this it just as a very quick aside, I think the music business didn't know what to do in the late 90s, early 2000s, and they ended up doing a lot of wrong things. Then they started playing catch-up, but at, at the same time, you have even a much more extreme version of monopolization of, of all of it, and I think that it's even worse now than it was 20 years ago when these conversations probably should have been having stronger um, uh, points of view from musicians and artists. I, I don't know. I, I don't, I don't see how, how, how you, you move forward. You have more accessibility to more things. So a person, a musician has more access to like garage band and, and the ability to produce something that sounds great in, in their own homes. And they have much more, ability to get that stuff out through band camp or whatever it is at the same time the economics of it are, are even worse than they've ever been so yeah. you have to measure accessibility and of, of of the musician and then accessibility of the consumer but it's not really a consumer anymore 
I mean, and the thing, and the thing, and just as my final point, to consider how great it is to have everything that's ever been recorded on my phone. But at the same time, are we really saying that it's acceptable to say that ten dollars a month gives me all of that? I mean, that's where you, you you're kind of up against the wall. And if you don't, if you want to use stuff in the classroom, if you want to kind of get a playlist to students to engage them, that's just a, a, a Gordian knot of challenging, challenging issues that are both economic issues and ethical issues, creative issues. And I don't think we're even coming, beginning to come close to figuring out a way that's acceptable to at least some of the parties, much less all of them. Yeah, I think it's even worse than something like publishing, which you kind of have the same conversations, but like... I mean, I don't know how much publishing has really been affected in a lot of ways, like certain universities and stuff have endowments and keep putting out like physical product, but, but music, I mean, I would just be, I'd be totally overwhelmed now if I was trying to be a musician and, and making money and, you know, even like you said, $10 a month to Spotify, but it's $0 on YouTube. I mean, you can get pretty much right. everything there. So I, I, know, I feel for them. So it's, you know, looking back, you know, first there's, when I was into music, there was kind of this creative pinnacle with these guys. You're like, oh my God, I can't believe they're, every album is better than the next one. And now looking back, like how not only the Beatles would sell, but like every major band, every album was just huge. I mean, The yeah. Doors, Led Zeppelin, The Who, like The King, you know, to a certain degree, like the single didn't sell, the album would sell, or vice versa. It's just like, that's it's not even close to the reality now. But that's sort of the model we still kind of work by you know like well everyone wants to be the beatles but even if you were now would you make any money if you wrote something how would you get it out there yeah i don't know yeah and just one last thing i want to ask about and watching this and i'm not sure how grounded this is in the historical record but like is paul was he kind of trying to push the beatles into touring again or doing like live gigs is that true is I, that kind of where he, you think he was going with this i don't no, you know, I've seen people refer to this this too. I think in this in this particular case, what you see is that Paul seems as reticent as the others, or at least yeah. he wants to do it on a very particular way. I mean, obviously George is like, <laughs> you know, the way he says he's like, I don't want to go on the roof. If you want to make me go on the roof, I'll go. <laughs> but he's like, I yeah. don't really, I don't want to go on the roof. I mean, obviously, what we do know is that you have wings. And Paul, more than the others, is going to put consecutive tours on. So maybe you look back at that. I, I think it's more of a question mark than – I don't think this gives us any stronger ideas, at least in terms of what we've seen. I think he certainly wanted to per, portray the Beatles in a way that made sense to him. I don't know if I, – I think he probably had to guess that that wasn't ever going to happen. I don't know. Well, and for people that don't know, I mean, the, the rooftop concert itself is a compromise because they're talking about going to – Libya the desert in North <laughs> Africa, yeah. right? Yeah. So they're yeah. able to talk in their cruise ship. There's that horrible yeah. idea. Um, so they're able well, to talk. They had like that one. Yeah. It was like a space outside of London they're going to do, and they were going to do that, but then that just, like, they couldn't get the permits in time or whatever it was, okay. it was taken yeah. up. But yeah, you know, you know, Michael Lindsay Hogg is like, well, let's take you to space or whatever. And they're like, <laughs> Michael Lindsay Hogg telling Linda McCartney he's a bigger Beatle fan than. Not, not Linda McCartney, Linda Eastman at the time, but telling Linda yeah. that he's a bigger Beatle fan than he, she is. It's like, what, what, the, what's, the, what's the point of that? Oh, my goodness. Oh. All right. Well, uh, well, Corey, this has been fun, and I'm yeah, glad great we could do this. All right. Well, have a good weekend, Corey. It's great talking awesome. to you, man. Thanks so All much, right, Take care. All right, that was my talk with Court Carney about the Peter Jackson documentary, Get Back. I hope you enjoyed that. You can check out Court's book, Cutting Up, How Early Jazz Got America's Ear, that has been out for over 10 years now, 2009, but you can get it on Amazon for about $20 in paperback. And I look forward to seeing the manuscript that Court has been working on on Nathan Bedford Force. I haven't seen anything yet, but that should be exciting once it is ready. You can also check out my book, Marching Masters, Slavery Race in the Confederate Army During the Civil War, available through University of Virginia Press. You can get the Kindle version for about $30. The hardcover is still going for about $40, but if you contact me, I can get you a signed new copy for about $35 but it's not going to come as quickly as Amazon would. So if you do want a signed version for a cheaper 
price, you might have to be patient, but you can certainly reach out to me on Twitter at Colin E. Woodward, or you can go to my website, ColinEWoodward.com, and contact me there. Twitter is probably the best. I'm on there quite frequently. But I hope you're doing okay. Uh, I, I have to admit that I had a, a major breakthrough this weekend and a major success, and that was in getting COVID. Yes, I finally got COVID. I tested positive on Saturday, was not feeling great on Friday night, and took a test. At some point on Friday afternoon, it was negative. Woke up with a fever on Saturday morning, and lo and behold, it was positive. So I've been isolated, door shut pretty much since uh, Saturday morning, and luckily no one in the house has gotten it, but I've been keeping my distance, and it, it really sucks. I know the case numbers are down, but still a ton of people are getting it, and I know some people online who have been getting it, so it is still out there, and no one knows how this virus is going to go if you do get it. And no one ever really seems to know how they got it, or if they, they did, maybe they were doing the same thing a few months ago and didn't get it. So it is very unpredictable. I'm not taking any chances. I'm just resting. And hopefully in a couple days, I will test negative. Going, going a little stir crazy, but it hasn't been too bad. I've been watching some movies, reading some books, getting some work done, and finishing this podcast. So I hope you are COVID free and you are enjoying 2022. I don't have anything to say about the Super Bowl, so I will be talking with you soon. Take care. Bye.